This podcast contains material of a violent and disturbing nature. It is not suited for all audiences. Welcome to episode 5 of Horror Tales, a podcast in which you can sit back and listen to a scary story. My name is Max Ablitzer and I'm the producer of Horror Tales. If you would like to support the show, please take a moment to share it on your favorite social media. Today's story was written by Clint Smith and first published in the British Fantasy Society Journal. It is called Don't Let the Bed Bugs Bite. Sundays have become unbearable. But before this Sunday, that is to say, before this morning, the only thing I seriously needed to worry about was nursing a hangover. Now things have become complicated. Now what I need to focus on is neglect. It may be consequence. Either way, This Sunday was different. Worse. I should probably explain what you're about to hear. Not a confession. I have no doubt what happened will affect others. But this is also a custodial exercise. An attempt to keep things as clean as possible. As sane as possible. I'll start here. This morning. I live in the country, in an old house, not quite a farmhouse, although I'm surrounded by fields and farmland. I woke early, feeling achy and lousy, my mouth still soured from last night's beer. The light seeping in from the windows was dim and blue. I laid there for a while, drifting in and out of sleep listening to the wind make the windows chatter as it rushed up along the eaves, making a low moan sound like blowing over the lip of a beer bottle. I'd picked up overnight, and I didn't have to look outside to know it brought more snow with it. I listened to other noises too, old house noises, the pinging and popping of joists up in the attic. From time to time, I could hear scuttling up there. Coveys of field mice, no doubt, taking refuge for the winter. I imagined other things up there in the attic, in the walls. Web nests of spiders. Wing-wrapped bats nestled in clusters. Twitching termites munching on wood. I tried not thinking about the cemetery, about Julie. So I continued distracting myself with the winter sounds I was hearing all over the house. Okay, right. The bugs. That got me thinking about that urban legend. Although, I guess out here it'd be considered a rural legend. The claim that dozens of bugs and spiders crawl in your mouth at night while you sleep. I asked Uncle Jasper about this the first time I heard it. I was probably in middle school. I always asked Uncle Jasper about that sort of stuff. My dad was pretty useless for advice, especially back then. Now he's just useless. Uncle Jasper sort of adopted me by default. I never had a problem with that. Uncle Jasper, 
sitting at the table in front of his typewriter, crinkled his already wrinkled forehead. Because of his prematurely gray hair, most kids thought he was my grandpa, and said it was nonsense. Besides, he'd say, waving off the story. Somebody would have to do a DNA test on a person's stomach to find out if there really was an abundance of bugs that had been digested. And that can't be cheap, Dennis. Uncle Jasper always did have a reliable built-in bullshit detector. Anyway, like I was saying, it was the noises in the attic that got me thinking about the bugs in the first place. And it's the bugs that got me writing this now. Trust me, I'm no writer. Sure, what you're hearing here might be serviceable, maybe even competent, but it's nothing more than the result of private practice. For the last few years I've been keeping a journal, which I keep fiercely private. Now Uncle Jasper on the other hand, now he's a writer. I've read the stuff he's written, poems, essays, and he's good, smart. He says he started writing after Aunt Susan died. Cancer. I always admired that. Uncle Jasper's resolve after Aunt Susan passed. He was honorable. And even though I'm not as good a writer as Uncle Jasper, or as good a widower for that matter, I like to think I'm like him in other ways. We were both born and raised here. Here being Deacon's Creek, what I used to think of as a blue-collar nowhere place when I was younger, but I've grown to appreciate it, or at least what it used to be. So Uncle Jasper has been here 67 years, me 36. And just like Sundays weren't always this way, Deacon's Creek wasn't always a town on the verge of financial and social emaciation. Now Main Street's just a slow-beating heart with withering arteries stretching out to other more bucolic towns. Oh sure, a few years ago some civic group got the bright idea to transform Main Street into something more contemporary. Something to draw in tourists on their shopping trips between Chicago, St. Louis and Cincinnati. A popular fast food chain replaced the flower shop. Harlan's Barbershop was taken over by a commercial shoe company. And the grocery store, where I was hired for my first job, was converted into a high-end antique boutique. But none of them succeeded, and the outsiders just left. Now we're stuck with empty stores, empty houses. Even the farmers are having trouble maintaining their small-town roots. A lot of the small-scale growers have had to sell their farms, or at least their fields. After some of the big-time companies came in, their families' business models collapsed and they had to sell out. For the last few seasons, outside parties have been using that land. Uncle Jasper says that these commercial guys have been using weird chemicals on those fields. DDT anhydrous ammonia, stuff like that. He said the seeds they're using have been genetically altered and that the corn can survive massive amounts of herbicides. Here in my clumsy explanation to you, I wish I'd have listened better to Uncle Jasper about a lot of things. One of those cornfields skirts the edge of my backyard. They've been using those chemicals for several seasons. It gets me wondering about what the chemicals have done to the insects around here. Honestly, in the past few years, I've seen what I thought were rabbits and other animals skittering about within those stalks of corn. Now I wonder if they were rabbits at all. But I was talking about Sunday mornings, and about Julie. I met Julie in college, and that was the only time I lived outside of Deacon's Creek. I dropped out after a year. 
came back here and got hired with the landscaping company, where I still work. But Julia and I kept in touch. Eventually I talked her into letting me take her to dinner. We dated for about six months before I proposed and convinced her to move to Deacon's Creek. She found a teaching job at an elementary school. We loved Sundays. We were married for a little over five years, so that gave us about 20 seasons together as husband and wife. We really had some wonderful mornings with each other. One of Julie's favorite things to do was clean house on Sunday mornings. We'd wake up, maybe make love, then drive into town, eat breakfast at a cafe and return home. Julie would turn on the radio. The college station was her favorite, one that played two hours of Beatles music. Beatles brunch, they called it. And open the blinds, letting the light stream into the living room what we would have eventually called the family room. I know she wanted that, a family. I know she wanted to turn this dilapidated place into a good home to raise kids. Anyway, Julie would make her rounds, dusting, laundry, vacuuming. I'd lend a hand where I could, but really, Julie did most of the work. She just seemed content. I should have and could have been a better helper. Julie died in a car accident. Maybe hearing that and telling you that seems abrupt, but so was the accident. She'd been coming home from work. It happened out on Country Road 700. A car full of teenagers, speeding, lost control of their car. It was a head-on crash. The three kids were hospitalized and lived. The doctor said Julie likely died instantly. Of all things I avoid recounting, that's the worst. Whatever or not Julie suffered. That was six years ago, seven years this coming spring. Uncle Jasper, having already gone through the process of coping with Aunt Susan's death, tried to help me through Julie's death funeral arrangements, the money, those sorts of things. In those first few months after the accident, I'd go out to the cemetery every Sunday and take flowers to Julie. I'd sit, I'd cry, I'd talk to her. And at first, I was eager to go there. At first, it felt like I was actually talking to Julie, and like she was listening. But then it started feeling lonely, as if I were just talking to a cold rectangle of marble. Then it just felt like I was talking to myself, and that was like talking to no one at all. So even though Uncle Jasper said it was good for me, and good for the memories I had of Julie, I quit going out there. Memories are funny like that. Why do you think people hang up pictures in their house? They need physical proof to validate memories. We all do. That's another reason I'm writing this now. To sort of keep what happened this morning glued together. I'm writing this now not only as an exercise to maintain sanity, but to bring keener clarity to what I saw this morning. Because if I lose my mind, then I can kiss my memories of Julie goodbye. I'm downstairs in the den right now, but I can still hear them upstairs in the walls. You might say a smart person might have called an exterminator. Maybe so. But knowing what I know now, a smart person would have never had time to call, because a smart person would have run. Here's a silly thing I used to do from time to time. 
back before Julie, back in high school, and during my first and only year of college. I'd make a chronological list of all the girls I'd ever kissed or had sex with. It was a physical list of physically intimate conquests. A list running from my first kiss, Kelly Baker, first grade, up through Nikki, which I'll discuss in a minute. I'm not proud to admit it, but in the years since Julie's been gone, and in my widower's loneliness, I've shared my bed with several women. Let me say that none of these women were the kind that leave sweet notes in the morning. Not like Julie. These women never said sweet things before falling asleep. I have fond memories of Julie leaning over and whispering, Night night, Dennis. Sleep tight, I'd say. Then she'd reply softly, Don't let the bedbugs bite. I've missed that little routine more than I can express here to you. That being said, this morning, laying in bed and further distracting myself from confronting the issue of going out to the cemetery, I began making another, more recent list. There was Abby, who I met at the library in town. Abby had the blackest, straightest, silkiest hair I've ever seen or touched. We saw each other for about a month or so, but things didn't work out. She was intelligent. I don't think me being a college dropout was a turn-on for her. After Abby was Vanessa, I was at a tavern down on Main Street one night with a few guys from the landscaping company. Vanessa was sitting at the bar by herself. I bought her a drink. And even in the neon dim light of the bar, her eyes twinkled green, almost emerald. So green they affected sobriety, albeit briefly. Things were short-lived with Vanessa too. She didn't ask a lot of questions and didn't expect a lot of answers. She liked meeting at hotels a lot. I think she might have been married. Then there was Nikki, a waitress at a chain restaurant a few counties over. Nikki was the youngest and the kinkiest. The worst and the last. Me and Nikki lasted for almost six months. But if things would have continued, Nikki would have been trouble for me. While she had a sort of fleeting, injured tenderness about her, she was, more than anything else, a casually cruel girl. Besides her frequently changing hair color, the most memorable characteristic about Nikki was her tattoo. A large, elaborate, praying mantis that ran from the outside of her thigh and wrapped up around her back, its long spiny legs extending up over her lower back. Only once did I inquire about the tattoo's significance. I was driving her home one morning when I asked. She was in the middle of lighting a cigarette when she looked over at me, froze for a few seconds before laughing laughing as if she were watching a child doing something adorable and totally foolish. It was a laugh I'd grown tired of. I kept driving. Eventually, Nikki quit giggling, sighed and lit her cigarette. I saw Nikki at a bar not too long ago. She'd been playing pool with a couple guys. Or rather, acting, like she didn't know how to play pool letting one of them repeatedly reach around her from behind to show her the proper way to use a cue. It's occurred to me before, although I haven't had the language to explain it until now, that there seemed to be some sort of emotional parasitism with these last three women, some sort of lonesome anesthetization. Sometimes, particularly when I avoid dwelling on Julie for days on end, I have dreams that she's returned to our bed, the bed I've disrespected, slowly materializing in the depression where she used to sleep, like fog drifting into a gully at dusk. Sometimes, in my dream-eager need to communicate, I speak. 
And as I do, my breath curls the delicate features of the phantom and the fog dissipates. As little use as I have for religion and superstition, I often find myself praying for that phantom to stay. The goddamn thing is this. Once you give license to wives' tales and the supernatural, once you sincerely marry mental energy and commitment, there's no telling what will break through. Most of these Julie dreams have been pleasant. Some of them even felt therapeutic. But sometimes they're bad. Or rather, their essence is bad. The tone is all wrong. And that feeling invariably carries over into the next morning, setting the miserable tone for a miserable day. It was almost as if, through the dream, Julie had been dictating what kind of day I'd have when I woke up the next morning. Last night I had a bad dream. So let me finally get out of bed, or at least tell you about when I finally got out of bed this morning. Let me get back to what this is really about. Neglect. Rousing myself from those cold sheets, I yanked up the blinds at the window and stood there, looking out over the countryside. Sure enough it had snowed overnight, and the wind was rustling some of the broken stalks spiking out of the cold white blanket covering the empty field. Again I think about the chemicals, the bugs. The belt of trees out west was all blacks and browns and greys under a pigeon-colored sky, which hinted at more snow to come. I closed my eyes and gently pressed my forehead against the frigid glass, the ice contact having a pleasantly sobering sensation. I started in with my usual litany of resolutions. No more casual sex. No more barroom arguing. No more blackout drinking. But then I stopped. I realized I was just making another list. Resolutions? I needed to start making promises. Promises I could keep. Especially if they were for Julie. I pulled my forehead away from the window and opened my eyes. I'm going out to the cemetery today, I promised. And I'm going to clean the house. So I decided to start here, with the house. After showering, I pulled on an old pair of jeans, a worn-out flannel, and walked downstairs. When it comes to accomplishing dull tasks, I've become a creative practitioner of delayed momentum. And at first I found a few things to distract myself from the real job of house cleaning. I started a pot of coffee, laced up my boots and stalked through the snow, and out to the mailbox to get the newspaper, and came back inside and started a fire in the cobblestone fireplace. Soon the house was filled with good smells the acrid percolation of chicory and smoky warm fire scents. I turned on the radio to some static lash jazz station. At this point, I could have easily given in to old habits. I could have dropped down in the recliner, started reading the paper, maybe turned on the TV. But this morning, more so than usual, I had self-disgust on my side. I stoked the crackling logs in the fireplace a few more times before setting the tongs down on the hearth. I opened every window on the first floor, noticing that a few gold spokes of sunlight were now piercing through the grey wool clouds. Dim light streamed into the house. I began spraying and wiping down the windows, the panes regaining their clarity. I went into the bedroom, tore the sheets from the mattress and tossed the bedding into the laundry machine. Now with the washer going and the antiseptic light revealing dust and spider webs, I set away to rearranging the living room and picking up clutter. After that came the next chore, dusting. I went from room to room, removing items from shelves, pulling novels from the bookcases, 
and wiping down all exposed surfaces. Copious amounts of disturbed dust filled the house. Glittering motes swirling in the grey shafts of sunlight streaming in through the windows. Now that I recognized some semblance of Julie's tidy and cozy Sunday morning home, the work came easier. I whistled along with the staticky jazz station playing in the kitchen. After dusting everything, I prepared to start vacuuming. I couldn't remember the last time I'd vacuumed the house. Months? Last summer? I still can't recall. Suffice to say, the vacuuming, like the whole issue of cleaning, was something I'd ignored for far too long. The old vacuum, a long disused domestic totem, which Julie and I had received as a housewarming gift, was in the back of the hall closet, standing behind a curtain of coats. I pulled the dust cake device from the closet, the outdated thing protesting with a few plastic creaks, and unwound the cord. I waved away some floating particles which the flimsy dust bag had shaken off, trying to avoid breathing into much of it, before flipping a switch and the vacuum, with a sustained wheezing, rattled to life. I began working over the carpet with smooth lunges, making my rounds from the den, to the bedroom, to the living room. At one point I realized I was smiling at the thought that Julie might be proud of my progress. This would be an appropriate moment to tell you something else. It was the dust that got me thinking about it then, and it's the dust that gets me thinking about it now. I've had all day to turn this over in my mind. And had it not been for what happened, I might have completely neglected a conversation I had with Uncle Jasper a couple months ago. It had been a Saturday night. I was at Uncle Jasper's house for our monthly chess match, which, as usual, essentially amounted to me getting my ass kicked. It was my night to buy the beer. He was craning over the chessboard, his heavily lined forehead summoning more wrinkles as he studied the pieces. At some point I glanced over at the coffee table, at a stack of magazines. The one on top was an issue of Scientific Frontiers. I slipped it off the table and flipped through the pages. An article caught my eye. Dust in the wind. Scientists wonder what will happen. I scanned the article, absent-mindedly numbling one of the enlarged excerpts. Common dust travels thousands of miles, over continents and oceans. Silently, I continued reading about new research into how dust was altering the environment. Tons of stuff, like smoke, sod and soil, make transport events through the atmosphere which can be seen from space. Pollutants, like dust and smoke, are evidently responsible for thousands of deaths in some countries. Skin, Uncle Jasper said abruptly, startling me, is the body's largest organ. Wondering where he was going with this, I looked at him from over the top of the magazine. He was still scrutinizing the chessboard, but was no longer scowling. A while back I read something very interesting, Dennis. Of course he had. Uncle Jasper, the consummate reader, the blue collar scholar. He continued speaking without peering up at me. The reason, dust starts off light in color before turning darker, eventually turning black, is because so much of it is made up of cells. That is to say, decomposing skin cells. I watched him watching the chessboard, wondering if he was trying to distract me or if he'd had too much to drink. The cell that makes up skin, keratinocyte, I believe, is the same cell responsible for keratin, which forms nails and hair. Now I knew this was some sort of destructive tactic. Nevertheless, I set down the magazine, picked up my beer and let him continue. We lose about 100 hairs a day, Dennis. He ran his arthritic fingers through his wiry tangle of grey hair. Each week we lose about, oh, a gram of dead skin cells. 
and we lose tens of thousands of skin cells each passing minute. Drunk or not, I smirked at him. Why are you telling me this? Because skin, my dear nephew. Uncle Jasper reached out and grasped his black bishop. Isn't the only thing you're losing at this moment. Check. And if I'm not mistaken, mate. Like I said, that conversation with Uncle Jasper took place months ago. I wish I'd remembered it sooner, but I'm not sure it would have done any good anyway. I was thinking about that dust discussion when the vacuum began making an awful noise. A low, weepy moan. It occurred to me, too late of course, that I had neglected to replace the dust bag. The whimpering din continued as I clicked the power button, which was stuck. So I grabbed the cord and yanked the plug. Now the mechanical noise from the machine died away, but was replaced by something else, something worse. At first, it sounded like a cat or some other animal had been stitched up inside. The mewling grew louder. I pried off the plastic cover and stopped short of detaching the bag. Something was shifting and squirming inside, as if filled with writhing knots of iron snakes. I'm sure anyone witnessing my reaction would have described it as something preposterous, something from a movie. Me, wide-eyed, slowly lifting my hand to cover my mouth and inching away. As the mewling grew louder, and the squirming became more frantic, another sound emerged. And although I write this to maintain some sharpness in my sanity and to bring keener clarity to the thing I saw, the thing I know I experienced, there's one thing of which I'm indefatigably certain. The voice. The voice that suddenly shaped itself from a ragged, nonsensual whisper. And that whisper hiss said my name. A thin laceration appeared on the dust bag. From the slit emerged the tip of what looked like an ink-dipped porcupine's quill. But now I have a more accurate description. A black widow's leg. Slender. Segmented. Shiny. Seven more slits appeared and seven more legs poked out of the bag, which was rattling to pieces like a dried out beehive. I could see an oblong smoothness inside and think now of the bloated tissue of a satiated tick. The grayish flesh was covered with dark, hairy bristles. There were other things embedded in its skin. Calcium colored pieces of teeth and bone like half-formed elements growing within the soft, timorous material. Then I saw an eye, a black, glistening eye, as large and as smooth as an obsidian billiard ball. I was unable to move. What I was seeing was impossible, but it was real. And in that awful dissonance between the impossibility and reality, a single sustained howl broke free in my mind. The sound made me feel both alive and nauseous. Maybe you'll see and feel something like that someday. I summoned enough of my threadbare faculty to shake out of my paralysis, making a staggering twist toward the fireplace, reaching out and grabbing the bronze tongs on the hearth and spinning back around. Despite myself, I made a few confident strides toward the kitchen. The bag was completely detached from the vacuum now, and the spider tick thing was on its back, its legs making desperate, wriggling swirls in the air. In what may have been panic, the thing started excreting a vicious web on the floor, made of thick strands of dark silk. Just as I opened the tongues, the thing righted itself, flopped over and grappled the floor. In a foul-smelling burst of dust, the tick thing vomited a pool of spiders and beetles. Small black scuttling things spilled over the floor, 
darting in different directions. I felt the first sick tickle of something crawling up my shin. And by the time I swatted at it, I felt something working its way up my stomach, my chest, my collarbone. I slept at something on my chin, feeling a wetness smear greasily near my lower lip. Holding my breath, I stepped forward, my boots crunching the black carpet of bugs on the hardware floor, and made a wincing grab for the spider tick with the tongs, pinching it around the bloated abdomen and shuffling toward the back door, holding the bag with the tongs and reaching for the doorknob with my free hand. The black widow quills were wriggling, gyrating in eight directions, slashing at the air. I twisted the knob, took one step onto the porch and pitched the thing out into the snow. It rolled and tumbled for a moment before balancing, those black legs quickly making a mincing retreat toward the barren field, trailing a cloud of dust behind it. I shuffled off the porch and took a few steps into the snowdrift thick yard, through the visible puffs of my rapid breathing and through the low-lying cloud of vacuum dust. I caught a glimpse of black bristles on the thing's back and of dozens of multicolored, arachnid-dotted eyes glittering in the weak grey light as those ink-dipped legs carried the thing across the snow. I stood there for a moment, trying to catch my breath, watching the knee-high weeds part as the thing scurried into the forest that fringes my property. I heard as if coming from numerous mocking mouths or mandibles, the distant echo of tinny giggles. It said, Suddenly, imagining the sensation of dozens of delicate legs crawling inside my clothes, I began sweating at my body, panic slapping the back of my neck, my arms, shaking my hair and scratching my scalp. Eventually, stillness returned. I was still. Dust from the shredded vacuum bag dissipated in thin wisps toward the sky mingling the pencil scratch trail of smoke and ash drifting from my cobblestone chimney. Somewhere over in the woods, a bird gave up a jerky sounding squawk. That was this morning. It's evening now. When I came back inside, I didn't see any of the bugs on the floor. But I could hear them in the cabinets, in the walls, rustling under the carpet. I thought about calling Uncle Jasper. He might know what to do. I still might call him, but right now I need to clean up the mess around here. I thought about leaving this document for him. Maybe if he finds it and can't find me, he could clean it up a little bit, turn it into something that makes more sense to someone who reads it. I've locked the door to the bedroom upstairs. The sounds are the worst in there. I have no doubt they're in the mattress. But before I do anything else, here's one more chore I have to accomplish. One more promise to keep. After I write this, I'm going out to the cemetery. Do me a favor. If you happen to drive by the cemetery, check in on Julie's grave. If there's a cluster of fresh flowers in front of her tombstone, then everything's okay. If not, and you're hearing this, then something's happened here. And I probably deserve it.
Thank you for listening to Horror Tales. If you wish to help the show, leave us a positive review in your favorite podcast directory. My name is Max Ablitz and I'm the producer of Horror Tales, including its original soundtrack and sound design. If you're in need for custom music for your own project, please get in touch via the website www.horrortalespodcast.com. A special thank you to Clint Smith for contributing the story Don't Let the Bed Bugs Bite. This story is part of his collection, Ghoul Jaw and Other Stories. To learn more about Clint Smith and his work, you can visit him on his website at www.clintsmithfiction.com That is www.clintsmithfiction.com Hope you enjoyed listening and let's meet again on the next episode of Horror Tales. Mm-hmm.